Uh, so today we're going to chat about. Okay, great. We're going to chat about uh, how to develop a family ministry uh, at your church, and uh, I have the joy of uh, being involved with a lot of different churches, speaking into uh, a biblical strategy that churches can customize. Uh, I know that everybody listening here has a different. Uh, experience in family ministry. You might come from a smaller church or a large church, multi-site, uh, uh, single site. Um, so we're wanting a an approach that is scalable and is replicatable, customizable. And, uh, and so I hope today, uh, whether this is a new um, discussion for you or you have a, a lot that you have developed over many years, I think you're going to find that there is uh, some helpful components in here for you. Uh, but I get to travel and work with a lot of churches. And so I wanted to just share a few quick trends before we jump into some of the how-to. Um, some of these you'll, you'll recognize and some may be new. Um, first, I'm seeing that there in a lot of churches is no family worship intentional plan uh, by parents and often not uh, any consistent strategic training plan um, to help parents disciple. Um, George Barna found in one of his studies that there uh, that the average family is not spending any consistent time other than um, kind of beds, bedtime prayers and mealtime um, prayers, uh, really de diving deep into any kind of spiritual matters with their kids. It's national statistics are only about 10 to 20 percent of parents um, are doing something on a consistent, regular uh, basis and have a plan. So this is a huge need, in other words, uh, for a, a high percentage of uh, families in your church. Uh, so even if you have a lot of very mature families, a lot of mature Christians, uh, chances are that many are struggling on a week to week basis to disciple their kids in any um, consistent way. So make, don't make the assumption it's happening. Um, second is that uh, very few churches have any uh, vision or plan to equip grandparents. Uh, many of them are marginalized and minimized. Uh, the Bible talks a lot about uh, the role of a grandparent and it, their impact. They're actually, um, some studies show that they're the second greatest influence spiritually in the life of children. Uh, simply, And that's simply because of the amount of time that grandparents have with the grandchild over the course of that child's life. Um, lots of people will come and go from a child's life uh, that will be influential, but you know they might have a a grade school teacher or a coach, but they're only there for a season, whereas a grandparent knows that child for a very long time. Uh, third is the infrequent church attendance that many of us see on a regular basis, and we continue to see the frequency drop. Awana did a study and found that the average child attends church now about a little less than two times per month. And, uh, and the challenge, of course, is that most children's ministries and youth ministries put the majority of their eggs in the age-based programmatic basket. It's not a bad thing, obviously, to have good um, children's and youth programs. Uh, that's where I've spent about 20 years of my life. Uh, but there has to be more than that, and that's what we're looking at. Uh, strong media and educational influence. Um, I, if you have kids, you know the challenge that this brings as far as media, the, the number of hours that our kids spend uh, on screens and devices anywhere. The average that I've seen is anywhere from four to eight based on study studies of hours with media every day. Uh, in education, uh, there's about 16,000 hours that children spend in an educational setting from kindergarten through 12th grade. And it's an area that a lot of churches don't talk about, uh, but an area that our kids spend that much time in impacts their faith greatly. And so we, uh, I think it's, this is an important, actually I'll, I'll call education and grandparenting the kind of the two big, big holes in family ministry right now that a lot of churches haven't um, incorporated or thought much about and are pretty important. And then the last one is, uh, I see some theological confusion about, um, uh, really family ministry from not only from the definition of family family that itself we define it as parent and child the bible defines it as extended family that it includes grandparents and aunts and uncles um i see the church what what i really like to see flipped a church often has a a church centered um family supported approach 
to ministering to the next generation. And I'd like to see that switched, uh, which is what I see from a biblical strategy to family centered church supported. So both church and family are um, institutions that God has created to disciple the next generation. And we want to balance those and, and um, leverage both. But which one in scripture does God um, put forth as the primary and most important? And of course, that we most, I think, would say family. And then the, the church comes in and equips and supports. The challenge, of course, is that that's often flipped in practice in that the church drives and family supports. And so we sometimes present this um, unintended message that primarily says to parents, um, you can come and be part of what we do and we're going to be the primary disciplers of kids. Um, and so it's kind of, it's very church centric. And so today I'm hoping not, I don't, uh, you know, I, I still very, I value, value children's and youth ministry very much. Um, but in many ways, some of that needs to be limited. Uh, we we want to do certain components really well programmatically, but some things may need to be limited to uh, to do the rest well. So those are some of the trends. Um, I want to talk through quickly a, a little bit of a grid for you that you can be thinking about as you, whoops, just dropped my paper, that you can be thinking about as you um, think about how to design a family ministry. If you think, uh, you'll see a grid at maybe the very end of the slides here that will put this all into perspective. But if you uh, imagine on uh, one side of a graph, the who, um, that I just talked through would be parents, grandparents, education, church, and marriage. Those are our, our five primary components of family ministry. And then we're going to talk through the how in, uh, in a little bit. Um, and yes, you can see that slide right there. So this should be real helpful for you. Um, I don't want you to get bogged down by this uh, as you look at it. Um, but each one of those quadrants presents an opportunity, a strategic opportunity for you to develop a section of family ministry. And so uh, most people probably think about parents as the primary piece of family ministry. And then you see a, a, a section there that says equipping opportunities. Um, I'll say that that segment is what most people think of when they think of family ministry. I think it's much larger than that. Um, so let me talk through the who, and then we'll talk through a little bit of the what. Um, so with the who, there's five focuses that I like to talk about with family ministry. Parents, uh, of course, we see in scripture, and I bet 99% of people uh, that are watching this would say, yes, we recognize parents are the primary uh, influence in a child's life that God created. Uh, you can see that passage right there in uh, in Deuteronomy 6. And there's many passages in scripture which speak to this uh, to this reality. And so the question I think for us as um, as pastors and church leaders is how do we actually align our uh, our day-to-day, our -day, week-to-week ministry to align with scripture? And that's a little more challenging. Uh, the second that you saw there's grandparents. This is where I've done a lot of work in my life. Um, both in writing and in, and in ministry, uh, there's quite a few passages that talk about a grandparent's role in Scripture. Deuteronomy 4.9 is probably the most succinct, uh, which talks about uh, teaching them. And of course, in context here, this is the law, the, um, the commandments of God, right and wrong to your children. And, and the key component there is children's children. And so grandparents have a pretty important role with the next generation as well and need to be part of our strategy. Um, there's quite a few things that can be done that I'll talk about uh, when we get to the, to the how. Uh, the third component there that I briefly touched on is education. Um, most churches avoid education because it is a, an emotional subject for some and it offends others to talk about it. Um, but if you've been paying attention to what's happening in society at all lately, you know that there are some very strong messages that are being communicated in, uh, in classrooms and in curriculum. And the challenge, of course, is that that can often derail a child's faith. And so, um, so the primary piece here with education is to help parents understand the messages that their kids are hearing. And of course, we want to um, train parents to have um, conversations about those messages so that they not only teach them God's truth, but um, but can stand firm when they're 
confronted with things that don't align with God's word. And we could probably, um, you could probably think of um, many things that fall into this category right now um, and, uh, uh, and are prevalent in, in the classroom. Um, this isn't as much uh, um, educational choice uh, because even Christian education uh, can be built on a wrong foundation. There's really two foundations for education. Uh, there is uh, secular and there's uh, a biblical foundation. And that can happen in whatever educational choice occurs. Um, you can go to the next screen here for the PowerPoint slide. And you can see quickly what, uh, what those differences look like from a, a secular perspective to a Christian perspective. And I, uh, I, I simply want you to see this for the reason that um, under that secular humanistic um, category are the messages that kids are hearing a lot today. And these are ones that uh, we need to be mindful of as shepherds of young people. Uh, so one of the things that I did as a pastor, as I built out a family ministry for parents and grandparents, I built an education component um, that tried to help um, students in all three spheres of education, public, private, and homeschool. They all have different needs. Um, and this, uh, the, the secular humanistic stuff, of course, is more prominent in some, but, but bleeds into all areas. Um, and so that's just helpful to be aware of, I think, as, uh, as pastors and church leaders and, um, and to be thinking, honestly, to be thinking through what does this look like for our families and for our children? And in scripture, um, educations, we kind of treat it in America as its own separate thing you know there's kind of church there's family and then there's education um scripture doesn't separate education out in that way it it comes under the umbrella of family and church um i'm separating it out here it's really a subcategory of the others but i'm separating it out simply because that's how we operate in the u.s and it's one that i think would be of great value for you to think through with your within your family ministry uh, fourth and fifth, I'll hit real quick and then we'll move on. Um, the fourth one here that we're touching on is the, the age-based programs that you have in your church. This is probably fairly well developed for most of you. Um, this is your Sunday morning programs, your Sunday school or children's church. This is your Awana programs, your Wednesday night things, your VBSs. Uh, these things have are fairly well developed in most churches. Um, and, uh, and so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on that one, but I think it's a key component of family ministry. And then the last is marriage. Of course, it's the foundation for everything. Um, and it, as marriages go, so goes the family. And so, um, uh, and so that's another component that we want to think about with, uh, with family ministry. Those are, so those are the five. Uh, if you could go to that last slide again, that had uh, that, that, uh, that, uh, kind of that grid that we're going to talk through. I want to talk through the how because I think that's primarily what most people here will be interested in and will want to see. Um, very end of the slide with uh, with the five on the one side and the all the yep. There you go. Perfect. Um, so let's talk through the, uh, the 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 what and the how at the very top that you can see there. So I look at family ministry as com containing five components. Uh, equipping opportunities are those areas that you are those times that you help train uh, an individual in this area. And so parents, um, they're going to need help with discipline. How do I discipline a young child? Uh, what's my purpose in parenting? Uh, grandparents need help understanding their role. They need resources to work with. Uh, prodigal children and long distance grandparenting, uh, marriage, of course, you got premarital things, you have um, uh, the preparation side, you also have some of the counseling side. Um, so you can see that's the, the equipping component. So what I like to do with the church is to simply say, okay, pick your, pick your group, who, which, which portion of family ministry is most important to you right now, and what is an equipping opportunity that you could plan in this next calendar year? Uh, would it be a six week class that you choose a book and you offer that six week parenting class? Or are you gonna do a weekend conference for grandparents? Or are you gonna build it into an existing Sunday morning structure? 
this is where the customizability, the scalability comes in your church. And so as you sit down and look at your calendar and you put some of those um, key areas on your calendar, um, then it becomes a sustainable piece. Uh, those equipping opportunities are often um, planned around a specific subject or a, a topic that is important that you want to train your uh, families on. And then as you do that um, consistently throughout a calendar year and continue to build on that, um, it be, it, it, it's fun to see a, a family ministry strategy really begin to develop and grow. Um, and and, uh, and so that so equipping opportunities is, a, is an important place to start. You'll see next to that is engagement opportunities. This is the rubber meets the road for families. This is what we this is the actual application, the implementation of what you're teaching them. So I like to say that we equip to engage. So uh, success for family ministry is actually what's happening in their homes, which is hard to gauge for us as uh, church leaders because it's not we're not seeing it sometimes. Um, but my goal with families, uh, I, you could see on the screen there. I use this phrase, every family worshiping together. So I want to see families reading and discussing the Bible, praying in their homes. I want to see them worshiping as families at church, one of the hours that they're there, um, and engaging with their children and their grandchildren to actually disciple them. And uh, and so the there's a very um, intentional strategy with equipping so that we put the kinds of uh, resources and topics in front that we can actually help them do it. Um, if you could go back to that uh, last screen that has all that has the grid, um, you can see some of the types of engagement opportunities that are available in each of the quadrants. And these are ideas for you in uh, in your you know as far as engagement ways that you can engage families. Uh, so with so with parents. Uh, one of the engaging things that I did was start a mother-daughter uh, and a father-son discipleship group where we would meet with moms once a month and uh, train the moms, and then they would meet with their daughter for a date once a month. Uh, so we called it eight dates, and then uh, we uh, did the same with fathers. We met with fathers once a month, and uh, they would have a... Uh, the goal for them would be to have a, a conversation that month with, with their son about a specific subject matter. And for probably 75% of the dads that are part of a group like that, that I've led, they've never done any kind of family devotions. Uh, many of them were uh, just didn't have a role model and uh, were quite excited when they uh, were shown how and encouraged and helped throughout the year. Um, and our mother, daughter, father, son groups have grown into dozens of groups um, that have met and they uh, we see discipleship happen that way. And they're, they're easy, I won't say easy, but they're, you can add them to your age-based programming at your church without adding a lot of weight and, um, and time for a staff. So you can see some of the other engagement opportunities, some may be familiar, some are not. Uh, for grandparents, uh, there's opportunities like grand camp that can happen um, in a location close to you that you could plan or that grandparents could host in their home. Gap groups are grandparents at prayer uh, that gather to do so. Um, so those are the kinds of engagement opportunities we're equipping. And then we're, we're in essence, creating the framework so that families can implement what we're doing. And they don't, most family, I when, when it's when I've seen a struggle happen, it's either because we've provided too much, where we say, "Come to this weekly e equipping opportunity um, for the year," and most families people don't want that or need that. They just need the the vision, the resource, the touch point, and then to help them continue to do that with some encouragement and accountability. Uh, the third one there is resources. I'll work through these last three pretty quick. Uh, is resources so. Um, you're going to think through the topics you want to train your families and then find a resource to match it. I used to give away um, a book every fall. I, I built it into my budget where I would buy a, a book and we would give away a certain number of copies. 
um, that we felt was important. We wanted to build a key library for our families, and that really helped our families a lot. Uh, we also would set out um, not a huge number, but about a half a dozen key books, and we would sell them at a discounted rate and uh, just a little table that we would put up in our hallway. Um, we would encourage families just as they saw a devotional book or a book about parenting or grandparenting or discipline, um, that it would be real helpful as when they, you know, a lot of families, you know, a lot of men don't read, um, but if they're given a book or a short resource um, when they need it and they've got hit, kind of hit a barrier, um, oftentimes they'll flip through it. Uh, and we found that, that that's very helpful. Sometimes it's simply um, a resource list or some other key components that you can put out. Um, the fourth and fifth one there are communication and counseling. So the communication really is a way for you to let the congregation know that this is a value and to continue to communicate that it's important. So that could be um, child dedications, Mother's Day, Father's Day, um, ideally from the pulpit, but also from your social media, your email blasts, your printed components. It keeps it in front of the congregation. Um, if you have an opportunity, sometimes um, churches let their children, youth, family, uh, individuals preach or uh, have opportunities on stage, I would take those and I would use those as an opportunity to talk about the importance of family discipleship and what that looks like in your setting. Uh, every fall we used to do an edu we still do an educators commissioning where we have all of the public, private and homeschool um, teachers stand up and we commission them as across the street missionaries with their important role with the next generation. Uh, we do the same thing with grandparents on National Grandparent Day. All of these are opportunities to communicate the importance of um, and, uh, and, and to include that in, in the life of the church. And oftentimes um, those who have been in children's and youth ministry long enough know uh, we're the we're the low man on the totem pole, and um, you know just because we do the same thing programmatically week in and week out, week in and week out, oftentimes it doesn't get a lot of attention in the services, and so this is a way to uh, um, build that into the life of the church. So kind of a ministry moment component, and the last is counseling. Um, this is the last segment that I think is important to think through with family ministry because as we talk about. Um, you know, helping families um, pass on their faith to the next generation, there's going to be some challenges and there's always hurts and there's always uh, struggles. And so we need to be ready for that. And, um, and if we've done, if you've worked with families long enough, you see some of the patterns of what are the key areas that they struggle with, such as uh, sexual intimacy and finances. And uh, I mentioned discipline a couple times for younger families. That is the key topic. Uh, technology, education, um, you, you can see some of the, the items there. Um, but we need to be recognizing and open to the fact that this is not a burden for us as, um, as church leaders, but that this is a key part of ministering to families. If, if marriages can't be um, healthy and strong, of course, it's going to be a challenge to pass on faith to the next generation. And so um, so here's my encouragement. You see that grid there. Um, my encouragement for you isn't to try to bite off that whole enchilada, but maybe you look at uh, one of the who's or multiples of the who's or um, you know portions of that and say, this is what is uh, important this year. We're going to try to accomplish this portion and this portion. And if you have something like this uh, that you can work from over the course of three to five years, you can build a very robust family ministry that uh, makes a very large impact. And of course, um, building that a little bit at a time allows that to um, not be a huge burden, but uh, you know, grow health in a healthy way and build a team as you go. Um, and uh, yeah, if there's any questions about any of these, I'm happy to talk through some of that. We offer uh, through the ministry that I'm a part of, we offer what's called a church revitalization where we come in and can help you design a strategy around this and implement it. We'd be happy to share more about what that could look like. Uh, that's found at renewnation.org. Um, but uh, I really, my heart is to see 
the next generation uh, loving Christ and walking with them. And we know that families is a really, really critical component towards that end. And so I want to encourage you to not see this as, oh, my goodness, like I've got all these um, age-based programmings. And then there's this whole family thing. Um, I think that this is part of God's strategy for the next generation. So uh, maybe there needs to be some adjustment in the programmatic approach that your church has so that you can do the family piece with the age-based piece and figure out how, you know, that's always a tension, how that, how those work together. And I'm not going to say this is what it has to look like for your church, because I think that's, you know, that's every church is its own unique organism. And so uh, that'll give you maybe some customizability around what that could look like in your, in your setting.